Well, good evening. We will call our uh, board meeting to order. Welcome to our regular board meeting for <clears throat> for this evening. We uh, have with us tonight students from Edwin Markham Elementary School. So we'll invite Principal Kim Mahaffey to come and bring his students up. Good evening, President Christensen, board members, Superintendent Whitney. I have with me tonight two of our leadership students out at uh, Markham, Ella Kemp and Max Raymacher, and they will be here to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. But before we do that, they did bring some visitors with them. If the parents would like to stand up, we wanted to recognize you for being here. Also with us tonight, we have our leadership advisor, Ms. Tina Buse. And I'm excited to also introduce uh, Markham's first assistant principal, Becky Hitchman. She has joined us tonight. She's, she's actually very amazing because I share her with another building, so she's uh, split in half, and, uh, we, but we appreciate having her. We'll go ahead and get started with the pledge. Max will lead us. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Well, thank you, Principal Mahaffey. I think we've got some pins for your students. If you want to come up here, we definitely want to get your picture with some of our student representatives. Yeah, why don't you come over here out of the screen? Thank you students for coming and leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance tonight and thank you parents for bringing them with you and thank you Principal Mahaffey. <clears throat> Could we get a roll call please? Present. 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 Thank you. All right, agenda review. There are no additions or changes to the agenda this evening. I would like to call the board's attention to our request for an executive session under 423110G for personnel. Very good. All right, so this is the audience comment portion of our meeting. We invite those who would like to share any comments with the board to come up to the podium. Please state your name and your affiliation with the district. And we'll open the mic up now for those wishing to speak to the board. Hello, I'm Annabelle Nacarado, paraeducator at Rowena Chess. I also do crosswalk on 24th and Sylvester. Um, one of the biggest concerns, and that school has to start it, but it's been a concern since I've been doing crosswalk. Number one, our school does not have enough radios, so communication is very vital for our safety, our kids' safety, uh, and for the school. There are not enough radios for our uh, people that do crosswalk or when they're out at uh, doing playground duty. So number one, we really need that because we're the pretty much first line of defense when they're out there if anything were to happen. Uh, number two is um, we have a big, big, big concern about the traffic <clears throat> on Sylvester. Where I'm at, it is 20 miles an hour. We do have, uh, thankfully, the Pasco PD and, w and Washington State Patrol have come out lately doing a lot of um, kind of monitoring, uh, but that doesn't happen all the time. On 20th and Sylvester, there is, of course, it's 35 miles an hour. 
you go from four lanes, four lanes, 20th and Sylvester and the turning lanes. And this year uh, has been so many close calls, also last year. I know that, I don't know how it's paid for a police officer to be in all the middle schools and high schools, but I suggest that you find some kind of money for at least 30 minutes from three o'clock to 3.20, 25, to have a police officer or paid posted on 20th and Sylvester. There have been so, so many close calls where people where are crossing, my coworkers are in the uh, crossing and the kids are there and cars are turning left because they have that left turn now that has a yellow blinking light. And for whatever reason, they don't, I don't know how they can't miss us. We're in orange and yellow. Uh, one of my coworkers a couple times has had her flag hit by a car going right through the intersection while she's in the crosswalk. They've been having to pull back the kids. My sister's one of those crossing people. She stations her husband at one of the corners and yells to him when it's safe when they look, even though they're out there, because there have been so many close calls where the kids are ready to step out and cars are zooming through there. Um, and I know the, they have the lights, but apparently not on 20th and Sylvester for those traffic lights to see people speeding through, passing the red lights. Um, from my understanding, the city didn't put them there. Uh, I think that's another idea. Another one um, is, and I know this is a city thing, so I'm gonna go to the city um, <laughs> meetings now. They need to post, and maybe it comes from you guys, those solar 20, you know, where it shows how fast you're going, because they, these drivers think as soon as they cross the crosswalk, they're tearing down Sylvester to get to the next light, either to get to 20th or to get down to uh, by the bridge, uh, what is that, 30th or whatever. So anyway, that's just a suggestion that I have. I know they did it in Grandview because I was there one time when the guys were installing it and they had, and I asked them why they were there and they said the same thing. People were zooming through the school zone, the women, the you know, whoever was doing crosswalk, cars were just zooming through there, even though it's posted 20 miles an hour. So I go, okay, that's something that maybe Pasco should look into because where I am, it is 20 miles an hour. And I've been doing it five years now and you can tell when they're doing 20 and when they're doing 35. Last week, we had a lady literally, as we're in our crosswalk, crept through 24th and got right in front of us where we were standing. So I stood in front of her vehicle. I wrote her license number down. She said something to me and I just said, look, you got flashing lights here, we got flashing lights there. You're supposed to be stopped at that white line way on the other side. So I don't know what she said, I didn't care. I just, you know, turned her in. Anyway, I don't know if they're gonna do anything about it because of the training that we've gone through. From my understanding, unless they violate, which means going through while we're standing there, there's really nothing that they do about it. So then it gets back to our low pay as paraeducators because we are like, and I said this before, you know, I will take it for the kids who are going through the crosswalk because that's what we, it's just natural. But our pay needs to be like combat pay, honestly. Because I've been one that I mentioned before, I've been hit, kicked, spit on, bit, everything else. And our wages do not reflect the safety that we put ourselves into for our kids. Thank you. Thank you and thanks for bringing those concerns to our attention. <clears throat> I'm sure on 24th and, or not 24th, but 20th and Sylvester, that's, uh, I'm sure that is a hazardous area there. So I'm gonna say this, I didn't, I didn't say this as being, but please limit your comments to two minutes and we'll, I think we've got a reminder over here. So go ahead. Hi, my name is Kim Holdman. I'm a paraeducator and a resident of Pasco. Um, I am again speaking on behalf of the paraeducators. As you look around, you may not see the same sea of blue as what you've seen in the past. Part of that is because a lot of us are out working a second job to make ends meet. I know I work two full-time jobs just to make ends meet. And I have a husband who makes an income. There's a lot of women out there who are single moms trying to make this work. On top of that, this year, our paraeducators for duty time has dropped. So we're out there doing twice the job, concerned about the kids with half of us out there and getting paid 
no benefit from the monies that have come to this district for the paraeducators. Yes, there's a loophole, so you don't have to use it for us, but is that right? Is it fair? No. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, uh, my name is Chris Mayfield. I'm a para, I've worked for this district for 30 years. I love my position and I love the kids and the staff that I work with. I think that the thing that's missing is understanding, you know, I know you know how valuable the work of the, of the classified staff is to this district. We are transportation, we are clerical, we are paraeducators. We are security. We hold many, many roles in this district. Our, our role is important. We know that, and we know that you know that. But I hope you realize that this, the, the self-esteem of these individuals is really low, and we feel undervalued and underappreciated because it's not being considered that the money that has come from McClary for classified should actually go to classified, that we provide something that's important to this district, and you're not willing to provide that to us. I don't think it's a good idea to allow the people who are doing this work for you and for our children to feel so underappreciated. That is not to your benefit, and it's certainly not to ours or to our children. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wishing to address the board? Hi, my name is Anita Chambers. I wasn't planning on speaking tonight, so hopefully I come across focused. Um, I've been a paraeducator for 12 years. I got into this job because I wanted to help the kids discover how much value that they have and how much they matter. My husband is a deputy sheriff for Franklin County. We both very much care about this community. We want to make it a good place to live, a good place for our kids, our grandkids to grow up, your kids, your grandkids. Um, both of us have a tremendous heart to do that. Both of us are in jobs that don't pay a whole lot and we struggle. Um, but more than being concerned about myself, I'm concerned about all of my friends that are living on single income budgets, trying to make ends meet as paraeducators who bring a tremendous heart just as I do to the position. And I just, I know that you value us, but we need to know that. Please do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, last call for anybody wanting to speak to the board. All right, we'll close the public comment part of our meeting. <clears throat> so, could we get a motion to approve the minutes for our September 11th meeting? Uh, Mr. President, I move to approve the uh, regular meeting minutes of September the 11th, 2018. Second the motion. So it's been moved and seconded that we approve the regular meeting minutes for September 11th, 2018. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. So we've got consent agenda, personnel, warrants, overnight student travel for Pasco High School to compete in the marching band competition in Muckleteo, Washington. Overnight student travel for Pasco High School DECA students to travel to the Fall Leadership Conference in Bellevue, Washington. Overnight student travel for Pasco High School Drama Club to attend the Inland Northwest Theater Arts Festival in Spokane, Washington. Overnight student travel for Stevens Middle School Natural Helpers to attend the Gormley Meadows Camp in Rimrock, Washington and approval of graduation dates for high schools in 2019. Can we get a motion? Mr. President, I move that we approve the consent agenda as presented. I'll second the motion. 
It's been moved and seconded that we approve the consent agenda as presented. Is there any discussion? If not, could we get a roll call, please? Yes. 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 <clears throat> yes. All right, so we don't have any action items tonight. So we'll move on to reports. Looks like our first report is on athletic fields. So, Dr. Susana Reyes. Good evening, President Christensen, members of the board, and Superintendent Whitney. As you may recall, the schematic designs for Middle School 4 and uh, Stevens Middle School replacement were approved on June 26th. These included the floor plans and the location of each school on the sites. And additional discussion regarding the athletic fields took place as well. As a follow-up to that discussion, this report is informational and provides an update on the field design for the two schools. The design development process for the fields included staff participation and collaboration from all three middle schools, as you can see a, a couple of pictures here for you. Um, and some of whom may be here this evening, but I know Raquel is here. Raquel and her, and her assistant principal. Uh, <coughs> yes. Um, and we greatly appreciate their time and dedication to the work, especially because some of this work did occur over the course of, of the summer months. We also this evening have Doug Mitchell and uh, Dan Kripaney from MMEC Architects with us. This is the design for the athletic fields at middle school number four. The graphic shows the location of various fields, including softball, baseball, football, and soccer fields, along with tennis courts. This is the design for fields at the new Stevens. And here, too, you can see the various locations of the fields and tennis courts as well. Per board request, staff measured the dimensions of bleachers at existing middle school sites and compared those to expected design at the new Stevens Middle School. The new bleachers at Stevens will have comparable seating to that of existing bleachers. This is a close-up view of the field at Stevens, showing the location of the bleachers, which is uh, just right south there of the track, okay? And this is an additional close-up and shows the actual dimensions of the bleachers. We recognize that current school sites may vary, and so we'd like the number and types of fields uh, at smaller sites to be at least proportional to the larger ones. So at middle school four, there's twice number of fields and so forth. And at Stevens, um, the number of fields are one each for baseball and uh, softball, um, but everything else is pretty comparable. Okay, for your reference, this table provides you with uh, the number of spaces or athletic uh, field spaces at each of the middle schools. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Reyes. Does anybody on the board have any questions for Dr. Reyes? I was just curious, um, the 28 acres at McLaughlin and the 30 acres at the new middle school. I think I saw where the 30 acres were. Could you go back to the McLaughlin and the, the picture of McLaughlin? Mm. This is the existing uh, Stevens. The, the layout of the field at McLaughlin. Or number yeah, four. so this where's the 28 acres? Stevens, you mean? Stevens. This is or Stevens, sorry, Stevens. <coughs> okay, so I'm sorry, your question? Um, on the chart that shows Sorry, let me go back here. I'm, I'm just curious about the, the Stevens McLaughlin in the middle school, 17 acres, 28 acres, and 30 acres at each of them. What, what is that of, just the play fields? I saw, I saw the 30 acres shown on the new middle school. Oh, okay. 
Um, but but can you just kind of outline? Is does it include the track and everything else? On Stevens. Or sure. On let's start with Stevens. Sure. So Stevens is a total of about 17 acres, the entire site. It includes the, it includes everything there plus the parking lot off to the across the street. That that whole parcel is 17 acres. So if we go back to the chart, I just I'm trying to understand if we're talking apples and apples here. So it's Stevens on the acres. The 17 is the entire campus. Yes. Yeah. Middle school number four, the 30 is the entire campus. Yes. Yes. This. This. Uh, all the. It's in, so how is in uh, the you know the green area there? Uh -huh. This part over here is. Okay. Uh, elementary school. So it school. includes the entire campus. Yes. All right. Thank you. So when. We get portables there, which I'm sure we're not going to get. <laughs> are, are they going to take over the basketball, the, you know, that play area, that place where our kids can be active? Is that the first place that they go? Or have they worked that out so that they can preserve some of those areas? In previous designs, we showed where potential future portables would go, and they would not be uh, located where current fields are. Um, I don't recall the exact locations, but I know Randy is here and the architects, and we can certainly have them point out where, where those could potentially go. I, d I don't like even care where they go. I just oh. want to make sure they don't go on where our kids are going to play basketball. And if they're not, that's great. I just think that sometimes we take away activity that's so important for our kids' brains and, and for their fitness. So great. I'm glad you avoided that. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Reyes. I appreciate you looking into that. I had a concern about being able to fit uh, bleachers at the Stevens site, but it looks like you've gone out and measured it. And it runs in my mind that the track at McLaughlin is a six-lane track. Is it actually eight? Does anybody know? All right. So if it's an eight-lane track, it's the same as at uh, Stevens. I see you've got an eight-lane track there, which... If my memory serves, that's even two lanes bigger than McLaughlin, which is great. But if we don't need all eight, then we can have even more room for for uh, bleachers. But anyway, I appreciate you taking a look at that. That was a concern of mine, just looking at the original drawing. But uh, I, I think it'll work well. Just one recommendation is turning that softball field 90 degrees so that your so that so that your left field is. Uh, the longer field instead of hitting it over the road there, but that's just my personal preference. If but you follow what I'm saying, right field, people typically don't hit as far to right field and you can hit over the fence into the homes there, but I'm sure we can work that out. I just think, a comment. I think it's impressive. I look at that site and everything you've put on that Stephen site and how well you've done it and you know, obviously a lot of great work's gone into it. Yeah, thank you for making it work. All right, so. Yeah, I just, I just want to express thank you to especially our architects. Uh, it feels like this has been an inordinate amount of reports and presentations on this and, and going back to the, all right, so I just appreciate the efforts and your patience with, um, with the board and, and staff in this. Looks very nice. So does anybody in the audience have any comments on the field layout? If so, now's your chance. All right, seeing none. Thank you, Dr. Reyes. Thank you. <laughs> so next up, we have a report on the bus lease program, Mr. Steve Story. Yeah, so it is my honor. This is uh, Mr. Steve Story, who's joined us as Executive Director of Operational Services. He does all things maintenance and operations. <laughs> he does all things buses and uh, meals and so forth. I just wanted to call the attention to the board. This, this particular report is on a school bus leasing program, and so it's informational. Um, 
there was some questions sent to us over the weekend regarding things like safe route to schools, ideas around increasing the opportunities for kids to be more active by walking, um, riding scooters, et cetera. Should the board be interested in adding those reports to a future agenda? Please just let me know at the end of the meeting. Um, but Mr. Story is here tonight to focus on the school bus leasing program. Thank you, Superintendent. Uh, President Christensen, members of the board, Superintendent Whitney, <clears throat> I'm here tonight to provide some information about a bus leasing program that we have the opportunity to take advantage of. First day, right? Um, some of the transportation needs here. Currently, we have 48 buses that are over the state's useful life standard. These buses are over 13 years, do not receive transportation vehicle funds, and the average uh, TVF reimbursement is $7,000 annually from the state. What our goal here in this, in this briefing here is to decrease the overall age of our bus fleet while minimizing the impact to the general fund. We have two options here. First option is to buy 15 new buses at the cost of 2.16 million dollars. Our option two is to lease the same 15 new buses at a cost of 2.07 million that includes the principal and interest of the lease. And a net savings of approximately $87,000. Some additional considerations here. First, we've had, uh, we've been working on some grants. The first grant is a school bus idle reduction grant. And what this grant is about, a, it's a, about $148,000 that will install some diesel, uh, some diesel heaters on 31 of our pre-2007 uh, school buses. You also have the Thomas, Thomas bus grant that provides 217,000 and the EPA grant of 525,000 to replace older buses, which is 35,000 per new efficient buses. And those, those two grants are based on buying the buses. And that's it. <clears throat> Any questions or comments from the board? We got a lot more information than that, and it was pretty interesting because you lease the buses for five years, and then we own them? That's correct. And it almost seems too good to be true. I understand we get all of these grants for new buses, so offsets the it offsets the cost of leasing, but we can get 15 new buses and in a way that we can actually afford them right now because there's no way we could buy 15 new buses right now. And we get to keep them, and it's going to cost less. Seems like a no-brainer, but it, and, but it almost seems a little too good to be true, too. It's Anyway, so it, it sounds great. We're really going to get to keep the buses after five years? That's correct. <laughs> Why do they call it a lease? It, it looks a, like a, a purchase. A what, so what, it's what's a the difference? It's, it's just what they're calling it. The, the way we went into the with how the contract was delivered to us, they just call it a lease. But it's, it's the same... Uh, same principles of purchasing under a normal situation, right? Like, usually when people think of leasing a car, they think, I don't, I don't own it at the end, I'm just basically renting it, right? And we're calling this a lease, but it, it looks like a purchase. But we, don't, but we don't have to bring up the, we don't have to have the upfront dollars for this, so it's a lease that we own at the end, and it's no, there's no buyout requirements like you would in a regular lease. That's the way I look at the difference in this. So my understanding, and I'm kind of looking at my fiscal people, is so there's a piece around if, as a district, we were to be loaned money, it would be non-voter approved debt, and there's some rules and laws around that. So I, my assumption is they call this a leasing program because it's not a loan program. So that's my understanding. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Story, for the presentation. Can you go back to that slide where you have the buying versus leasing? And you obviously had the same questions. You know, if, if you, and if this year has taught us anything, it's that public education funding is not straightforward. But uh, still, you look at this and it's like, okay, if, if you compare it to leasing a car or even getting a payment plan for a car and, and, and the dealership says, okay, well, you can buy it now for 21000 or you can uh, pay me $4,000 a year for five years and it'll only cost you 20000 I mean, it just doesn't make sense if, if you're the producer of the bus. 
or the seller of the bus, it's a real bad deal for you. So I, um, you know, I don't know. So if it's grants that do this or what, what the, how we get the benefit when we're receiving the benefit by not putting the money out up front. But, um, and it would beg the question, well, why doesn't, why would anyone buy a bus? And why is, is every single district in our state doing this? Because why would you not? And why did we ever buy buses if this was always the, you know, so it must, so I don't know if you know any of that. That's a lot of questions, but that, those are the questions that come to my mind. Well, why would we ever buy a bus? Why does anyone, why did anyone ever buy buses? And is this because this is a new program this year? Um, but right, obviously it's a no brainer. There's, unless there's some sort of catch that we, they're gonna drop on us. <laughs> it sounds like people have figured out how to work within the uh, rules that are set. <laughs> Use the language and work within the system that's set out for them. So, so on the next slide, we could, um, there was, you said something about a $35,000 on that Thomas bus replacement grant. There was $35,000 that you can't get if you, if you use the lease program versus buying, correct? No, ma no ma'am. So each bus on that 20, that 525K, that's for 15 buses, 35,000 a bus that we receive in a grant dollars per every bus we buy. I see. Okay. It, it, for every bus we purchase purchase or, or lease replace. or whatever whatever you want to use as a term in this in this project I'm so sure. if we were to buy if we were to buy the buses we still could get that 35k if we lease the buses we get the 35k per is that is that because we're replacing buses or is that it's just a, because these are more efficient and they're saying that you're they're assuming that you're replacing an old bus that's polluting, so the EPA is saying, here's $35,000, thank you for taking that other one off the road and that's correct. putting this one on. That's correct. Okay. So, Thomas bus replacement. I've noticed that the buses that we have now, the new buses are Thomas, is that correct? And some of our previous ones have been Bluebird, I believe. They're, they're different. They look national. Yes, sir. Well, the bus the uh yeah so i'm wondering what is this thomas bus replacement program is that like a rebate from the manufacturer i don't know i don't know about how the grant is i just know that the, the thomas bus if we it's part of a grant of buying buses of thomas they are providing us grant dollars per bus so i'm purchase I'm, of other buses I'm guessing this is just a creative way to finance buses and, and somehow they've finagled it so that it works that way. Going back to your previous slide, if we were, so there's a lease company apparently. If we were to go to Thomas and buy these buses, what you're saying is it'd be $2.16 million. Yes. Whereas if we go to this lease company, we can get them for a lot less than that. Hmm. Interesting. Creative financing. So on this other information that we got, it said that we would save, um, the district will begin to receive an additional uh, $7,000 per bus per year um, with a vehicle, transportation vehicle fund, so which would be 105,000 per year. <coughs> yeah. I'm so you're right, in addition, so why don't we buy 30? Because <laughs> we don't need 30, we don't yes, want to. <laughs> We do have, we, we have 45 buses, don't, isn't it true we have 45 buses that are? 48 than, buses that are over the depreciation number, the useful life, yes. Yeah. Just a thought. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you can look at our, some school districts do think that you should just tear down schools and rebuild them. No. Even, I, know, I know, I know, I'm just saying, I'm just using it as a, it's an interesting, you know, thought, but, um, you know, again, there are some school districts that just want to tear down buildings that maybe are working okay still. Essentially, all the elementary schools that I went to no longer exist. Uh, and they, you know, anyway, so we do have to look at that. Are things still usable? And we need to be efficient, you know, right with our, but that is a thought, you know. If, but. but if you're getting, but if you're getting $105,000 for your vehicle for the, per year. Well, it's 7000 per vehicle, but yeah. I mean. Uh, they're, they're trying to, they're hanging a carrot there. Yeah, like, hey, dude, buy a new and you can, yeah. Anyway. At least new. Yeah. yeah. So the 2018 grant told us the 890, that's a one time, that's one time uh, grant. Okay, so I'll break that out a little bit for you. So, so let me see what slide we're going to. So 
We'll break that out. So the 148.8, that's for the, the that, that's for the 31 pre-2007 buses that we would put those idle reductions on, right? Right. The two grants of the 742 would come with it, which is a grants for buying the new buses that it should be used to buy more buses. More energy efficient. And are, are those based on buying 15 buses or as you buy more buses, do those go up, those numbers? They would. Especially, okay. especially the one, the EPA one, where you're getting 35K per new bus. Yeah. So it, I think it, I understand it, what, she, what Ms. Lincoln's saying is we're going to have 15 new buses. We're going to make, not make, we're going to get uh, $105,000 per year. And over the 13, the next 13 years that are, those are in service, we're going to get $1.3 million in TVF or transportation vehicle funds. In addition to that $1.3 million, we're getting $700,000 from the second two grants here. So we're basically getting the buses fully paid for. So if you could ratio those second two grants, she's saying why not, why not buy more? They're going to be fully paid for between the combination of the transportation vehicle fund and those grants. Great question. And, and I, would, I would agree with that. Part of it is for the, the leases to get the 15 buses. Over the next five years during that lease, we would procure more buses with the dollars that we're receiving. So we would increase from 15, we could probably get as far as 23 buses with the dollars that we're receiving. Is that what, the, is that but, what you're asking? Yeah, but if it's zero down, essentially, we're basically putting zero down, the money that we get in transportation vehicle funds, the hundred and some thousand would, would pay that entire fee for the buses. So why wouldn't we buy them all right now? What's the downside to that? If there's zero out of pocket and we're gonna be receiving transportation vehicle funds, every year and we can sell the buses that we have no 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 once they once they are in, out of their useful life there's a there's a different disposition on the buses or you, can, you can answer us later i guess yeah if, i don't have, you don't have an answer, an answer I, i'm trying to but i know you sent us that additional data today i, I can't remember what the what the yearly cost was over the four years, it might have been, that might be the, the stipulation is we don't have enough money to pay that all, at, all in one shebang. If that's the answer, that's fine, but it's an interesting That's why we're thought. going to the lease versus the buy. Yeah, it looks like we're basically getting the buses fully paid for after 13 years. But we have to pay it off in four Five. years. Five years. Five, Five years. years, yeah. yeah. So that'd be the, we don't have the fund. Okay, any additional questions for Mr. Story? All right, anybody in the audience have any comments on buses? All right, thank you. Thank you. So thank you, Mr. Story, for that Thanks. information. Thank you. Appreciate it. <clears throat> so next on the agenda is our extended study discussion portion and we have asked Ms. Sarah Thornton to come back and to talk to us about elections and uh, school director districts basically I believe so Ms. Thornton. Thank you. Uh, Board President Christensen, uh, Superintendent Whitney and board members. Um, as Mr. Christensen said, um, I have been asked to come back and provide you additional information uh, with regards to uh, what is the uh, Washington uh, Voting Rights Act. So an update to the uh, study session uh, that we had um, earlier this year. Um, so just by way of recap, the, the issue of the district's electoral system, or in other words, how our board of directors is elected by the community, um, was initially brought to the board uh, for consideration by a community member during public comments in July of 2017. Uh, and the point that the community member made at that time, uh, or the request rather, was for the board to study this issue, um, and the issue being um, consideration of whether um, PASCO's current at-large election system for 
uh, board members um, actually reflected the um, the district's uh, demographics um, in the district's neighborhoods and and the point being made that um, the the demographics of the neighborhoods in Pasco weren't necessarily reflected on the on the um, board in the way in which board members had had been elected so in response to that I was asked to uh, provide you information at a study session we did that in January um, of this year Year. Um, and at that time, we discussed the state um, state law. At that time, uh, we also had a brief discussion around district demographics generally um, and some legislative activity from the previous year. So, just to recap that discussion, <clears throat> excuse me, we noted at that time that the only mechanism in state law um, for the district to make a change to your electoral system was found in RCW 28A 343. 030. And what that section did is provide a way for directors who, for, for school districts who wished to change from an at large. Uh, voting system and, and what at large means is that even though you as board members are in designated positions all eligible voters in the community can vote for each member of the board of directors there's no geographic boundary um, that that identifies um, a position on the board your your each seat is currently elected by the entire community and that's called an at large system so what the um, what 28A343 or 030 rather does is provide a way for uh, school districts to change from an at-large system to either a director district system or some other combination thereof uh, and provide a process by which after the board made that decision you would put the question out to um, to a vote and it would need to be approved by voters in the community before you um, move forward um, so so that has been the state of Washington law for school districts up until now of course the Federal Voting Rights Act has also uh, been in place um, and does provide a mechanism for uh, for individuals or uh, the government to in essence sue um, local jurisdictions to force um, a remedy or a change in the uh, in the voting system so those were really the only two options um, that the board had up until recently so the landscape uh, has changed since we had that um, discussion back in January. Beginning in June of this year, uh, the Washington Voting Rights Act um, has been in effect. And this law provides a new mechanism for all jurisdictions in the state, including school districts, um, to uh, change their election systems without putting it to a vote. Um, it also provides a cause of action in state court um, for violations of this law. So in other words, um, the Federal Voting Rights Act allows um, the district to be sued in federal court. The Washington Voting Rights Act would allow us to be sued in state court. And it applies to all political subdivisions. The intent of the Washington Voting Rights Act uh, is to ensure the principle of one person, one vote. Um, the legislature found that um, by that, that the law was necessary to prohibit electoral systems that would deny um, racial, ethnic, or my language minority groups an equal opportunity to elect candidates of their choice. Um, the legislature also found that as, as various laws applied to various jurisdictions um, within the state, that some of those requirements were such that state law was actually resulting in um, improper vote dilution um, in certain jurisdictions. And so um, the, the Voting Rights Act was passed. 
uh, and provides two ways for a local jurisdiction to remedy a potential violation. Um, one would be through court, through a lawsuit, um, where a, uh, an individual could bring um, what would be known as a vote dilution claim against the district. Um, and if they did that, if we were sued in state court, uh, we would, the uh, person bringing the suit would need to show that protected class voters within the district um, consistently supported candidates who were different from those supported by white voters within the district um, and show that protected class vo voters do not have an equal opportunity to elect the candidates of their choice. So there, there are, there's data that they would have to provide um, and certain burdens of proof that they would have to meet to be successful in a uh, to be successful in a lawsuit the other um, the other change uh, brought about by the washington voting rights act is probably more significant to um, to the pasco school district and that this has been a subject of interest now for the board and that is the ability to voluntarily change your electoral system um, in order to do that the district would have to um, study the issue uh, gather um, information look at developing um, director districts and 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 um, develop a proposed solution you would need to make a finding that the district believed there was a potential violation of the Washington Voting Rights Act um, inherent within our current electoral system you would then provide public notice um, and hold a public meeting uh, at least one week prior to board action um, to adopt a plan if that was something that the board wanted to do um, and the only real requirement of a a plan or a revision to your electoral system is that that plan cannot create or perpetuate vote dilution um, it, it would have to um, it would have to um, do what the law intended it to do um, having taking a voluntary action like that does not um, would not protect the district from future lawsuits if um, a, a citizen still wanted to come and challenge the plan in the future um, there is no safe harbor um, for the district we would still have to litigate that potentially or look at further revisions to the system um, but it would create a mechanism for the board uh, to act proactively if that was uh, something that you wanted to do there are specific timelines around that uh, and so if and, and these timelines apply in perpetuity so for example if we were to look at this this year if the board made a change and took action on a change to the electoral system sometime between mid-november and of this year and mid-january of 2019 um, you would have a whole new election in November of 2019 which is your next regular election and it would not just be for the seats um, for or the positions uh, that were up for election in that year it would be for all positions on the board if you were to take action between mid-January and mid-November of the following year in 2019 you would move forward with the regular election in November of 2019 and then the year following or November 2020 um, you would hold all new elections for all seats under the new system so as you discuss this tonight here are some suggested uh, questions for you to consider um, whether or not there is uh, community interest and concern about this issue that you feel needs to be addressed are there public policy reasons for uh, making a change that should be considered um, looking just at the demographics the per percentage of protected class voters um, in the district geographic locations um, and whether or not uh, protected class candidates have been um, historically successful or unsuccessful in district elections would be things to consider Do, do you have that information or I don't oh, have, have that information Scott the um, what we 
so, so the purpose of tonight's presentation was to update you uh, regarding the change in the law and what um, some new options for you might be. If the board decides that you want to move forward with further study of um, this topic, if you want to move forward with consideration of what um, a revised electoral system might look like or even diving into the data around whether or not um, there are data indicators that would be of concern um, regarding potential violations of the Washington Voting Rights Act, then we would um, we would retain um, experts in the field who could help us with that to provide you with that data and information. I <clears throat> I think this is a great idea. I think it's necessary. I think that we do lack some representation on this board. I realize we might, I might be talking myself out of a job here, but, um, but I, I don't think our board is di diversified enough. Um, my concern is we haven't had a lot of diverse candidates. So I think my biggest concern is that diverse candidates are going to come forward and and um, and be, anyway I'm not sure why we don't have diverse candidates if it's because they feel like they're not going to make it on the board anyway or if it's because they there is a lack of interest there so I don't even know how to find that out um, but I you know I guess the timeline would be it, it almost seems like it would be easier to do it on November 2019 because we have, do we have two board members up for re-election then? Because I, I'm not up for re-election, but with them they would have to, they would have to do a re-election and then another one. And, and it's a pain in the rear end to run for office. So I would hate to make those two board members do it two years in a row. But even though it would be easier for me to wait till 2020, I'm I'm for that for those two board members that are going to be up, and and I think that this is a great thing um, to do. I I would like to look at the different ways. You know, I know we can do all um, director areas, or we can do like two at large and three director areas. I think I'm more prone to the three director areas with two at large but or more leaning that way but i don't know what my fellow board members are thinking that's my opinion on the whole matter yeah I, i'll just say right but i agree with miss phillips as far as um the three i think a combination is the best uh, i would be in favor at this point unless i receive new information but based on the research and study i've done so far three director dr districts with two at large i think that that's a good mix and i have a similar concern about just the availability of candidates that want to do it especially considering this that last year there's it's been stressful actually the last couple of years even before I was on the board the environment has changed and uh, so I, that would be my concern certainly with having five districts that, that we may not have enough viable candidates but my question with this timeline is how would we decide or at what point and who would decide the the district the boundaries the the actual districts and and that's the piece and I'm glad you you asked that question dr. Richardson and and that's the the one piece that I think concerns me about the shorter timeline is having adequate adequate time and resources to dedicate to that effort because it it will take some time and a considerable amount of information to be able to do that in a way that meets the legal requirements and also meets the needs of the community so there individuals we've been talking with the city of Pasco as you know the city of Pasco went through a different process but went through a process nonetheless to um, to redistrict um, and move to a combination at large and um, representative district positions um, we have been talking with the experts that they utilize to help them walk through that that process um, they um, are familiar with our community they have um, subject matter expertise and so that would be our initial recommendation what we would do is schedule time with them um, to um, give you those details about what that process would look like and what those reasonable timelines would be yeah, I mean, if it's reasonable, I would be in favor of doing it now as well. Um, I think you brought up the city of Pasco, and I think there that's a great example to kind of look at. And and really, the question of this comes down to uh, essentially, if you look at our federal government, we have um, 
legislative branch, judicial branch, executive branch, and then legislative branch, we have, you know, we have senators and representatives. And do we base this more where everyone gets two representatives or do you base on population? I think the trouble that some people saw with the way that the city did it is there are three districts uh, where in the general election there were less than 500 votes for those th in each of those three districts, and I actually just pulled it up real quick. The other three districts had 1,468, 2,503, and 2,903 votes. So if you compare that, it's like, okay, well, is that fair? Those one of those candidates, the two of those candidates, they had to compete. Uh, to win 50% of almost 3,000 votes, while three other districts had only uh, had less than 500 voters in each. So this is the difficult question that is, to me, what it comes down to, which no one's going to want to discuss or talk about, and that is, how much, what should the representation be for people that are not registered to vote for whatever reason? So if you have an area where there's literally only 500 registered voters and another area where there's 3,000, or so how do you represent that? Do the, should that be represented equally because there are a large number of people there that are not registered voters but that are part of the population there? Or do you base it more on number of registered voters? And that, to me, is the difficult question. I'm not saying uh, anything in favor of either one. I'm just saying that is the fundamental question question that is a struggle and that is going to be hard to discuss because it'll stir a lot of emotions in people. So to me, that's the most challenging aspect of this whole conversation is how do you draw the boundaries? And so that would be my primary concern and question. How is that? We don't, I don't want this to be some long drawn out process that gets in the way of our, you know, education that we're doing this whole big long political you know uh, thing to do this and spending all these inordinate amount of resources and time uh, and, and getting away from it, the education of the 18,000 students in our district to make some political statement or to me that's a mistake sure. and, and if I could just offer in response um, to that I think that you know your concern is your concern is noted the, the law itself, I think, offers you some specific guidance about how um, the, the criteria under which those districts would be drawn. And really, philosophically, both the federal and state law approach it from the standpoint that a, a, um, a jurisdiction, um, local government, state government, um, serves a community at large, not just a voting population. I think that's the, the philosophical underpinning of both of those statutes and so I think that you'll see the guidelines in um, the laws around how you draw those boundaries recognize that and approach it from that way but there is more information that the board would have to be able to rely on to to I think answer that concern if you chose to move forward yeah, no, I agree. I think you're correct in that assumption and in that statement. And uh, but that would be my concern that we would get into this drawn out um, community discussion and debate about that because that was a lot of the concern with the way the city has redistricted their um, districts, and that brings up the concern about having um, candidates from each area if they're because they have to be a to, to be a candidate, you have to be a registered voter. So, anyways, those are my concerns. I did have. Um, well, well, go ahead, Miss Lincoln. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, no, go ahead. Yeah, that, th those are it. And so um, if you could bring that, how long would it take? Just that, that's my one question is just the, the boundary and how, how that would, who would do it, how we would do it. And if that, that would be the primary determinant for me. Okay. The other thing that's the, a determining factor between, difference between the city and between the school board, the city members board, uh, on the board are on, their, on the council get paid. And this is a volunteer position, and um, and we we don't get anything, and um, and and there are a lot of hours and a lot of time that's involved in being on the school board, and and people don't realize it until they get involved in it, and unless you have been um, involved with uh, being in on committees and all of that and been involved in all those things, you don't realize how much time is involved in being on the. And so that is one of the reasons why you don't get people, because when we've had people that have resigned and we've had maybe 10 or 15 people that have come in to, um, that think they, want, that they might want to be on, take the position to finish out the term, and then they, when they realize how much time is involved, because we go through an interview process, then, they, then they're kind of disillusioned when they realize how much time is involved. 
So that's another factor to think about. I know it seems like the system is naturally discriminatory toward different classes of people. So, you know, I don't even know, yeah. If I was a single mom, eh, there is no way I could do this, none. But I don't know how to fix that. Well, see, oh, go ahead. Um, I, think, I think it sounds like the right thing to do, but my question, it says if the board unilaterally makes the decision, you're still open to lawsuits at a later time. Mm -hmm. Is the option still open to us that we were talking about before that if all five of us or the majority of us here sitting <laughs> here believe it's the right thing to do to put it to the public in the vote like we were planning on doing and, um, and see, let them decide? That's a great question. Um, so I would need to go back and research, um, Scott, whether the Washington VRA supersedes um, existing state law, um, because I'm not sure that it does. But I can get that answer yeah, to you. I, before I made a decision, I'd like to know that. But I just, uh, yeah, <laughs> still being open to the lawsuit, you know, after you unilaterally make a decision versus the old process where you could make the decision and allow the public to vote for it concerns me a little. I don't know if I, that would even change my mind. I think sometimes we have to make decisions. Anyway, I, the, the community is, I think our schools are 70% Hispanic. It's just not reflected among the five board members. And, and I think it would be great to have a voice that would represent, more represent that, that group of people. And um, I'm, I'm hoping if that happens that there are going to be people who are excited about having the opportunity to, to, um, to represent an underrepresented group of people. So I, I, I don't know, I guess we could put it to the, vo the vote. I, I would prefer to make that decision as a board, but anyway, whatever you want. But we have had his Hispanics on the Yeah, board. I was gonna say the same oh, thing. No, we have. So. And one of them's on the city council right now, so it's certainly not, and there haven't been many candidates recently that, so again, that, that's what we'd have to look at. Is it really even less feasible or is it, you know what I mean? Because we've certainly for years have had many members and one is on the city council currently, another one that I'm just looking at is very involved uh, in the community. So again, it's, um, that'd be interesting to see. As far as the boundaries, I would say that, and I kind of approach the school boundaries in a similar way. You know, you can dissect it in every little way, but in the end, a, just a natural boundary, if you're comparing, trying to choose between one or two or three that are similar, a natural boundary is just the most, to me, the most logical with our schools, since we're gonna have some upcoming discussion about that. And I would say the same thing with something like this. You know, we could get bogged down into all these discussions and data and numbers, but you know, you, you look at the interstate and 20th or whatever it is, and you just have a natural, logical boundary to me that's uh, but I'm simple-minded sometimes to me that's the most logical reasonable way that you would divide it up but if we're going to have all these restrictions and it may not be that's going to be frustrating can you go back to the timeline there you bet. so what what is board action is that does that mean we have districts identified and we make that decision Okay. That would be the full plan. You would you would be approving the the full plan, and so it presumes that um, before January fifteenth, twenty nineteen, that process would be complete. Is we, that even feasible? No, I, I don't think so. Well, I know, I well, how long did it take the city to get their plan? Oh, it seemed like it happened pretty fast. But. There was a lot going on behind the scenes, Scott. So I I I don't know for sure. So I, I mean, just looking at this, I, I would, uh, I would think it would make sense. So, I mean, right now, have you? Do you feel any pressure that we have to do something quickly? I, I don't. I don't know if any of my fellow board members do. I'm just wondering. Do you? Have you got a sense from anything anybody in the community has said? Any input to the district? So from, from my chair, my sense is that this is an issue that the board should take up. 
Um, I don't get the sense that there is pressure for you to follow what I think reasonably would be an unreasonable timeline to push something through um, for November of 2019. I, I think that there's a, a high degree of study and community engagement that um, that I think we would all as staff recommend occur and, and it sounds like you would want to engage in as well. Um, and just given that tight yeah. timeline, I don't think that's feasible. Okay. No, I, I, I wouldn't suggest we do it then I'm just wondering if there's any so um, I mean I certainly think we need to reach out to the community and get their input on this rather than just unilaterally making this decision I, I'm not sure how we would do that or what that would look like uh, I think we have to be careful that we don't do it in a divisive way but rather seeking input just looking at this schedule, so I'm assuming if the, the, the schedule rolls over using the top one, pushing it out two years, these dates are set by the, by the uh, law, right? The November to January dates are set. Yeah. So if we looked at November 20 to January 21, there would be three board members up for election that year, three seats up, and then of course we could, the two that, that are up for election in 19 would be impacted they would you know presumably some there'd be two members that have two seats that would have served or the two members that would have served two years and they would have to run for election again but um i i don't know that we need to be in a big hurry i think that's going to depend on what feedback we get from the community but i would suggest that we start there and do it in a way that's sensitive and then uh, as long as we don't feel like we're in a hurry, I don't, uh, and, and we're doing something to address this, then I, that would be my proposed course of action. I, I tend to agree with Steve. If we can't do it in 2019, I would prefer to do it in 2021. This is something I felt strongly about for probably, I don't know, four years. I know things take time, but I also know the amount of work that goes into an election and to ask board members to do two years back to back is a big ask for volunteers for this community. So. I guess I would say, yeah, if it's not feasible to do it in this year that or for November 9, 2019, that's fine. If you need like a springboard, sometimes we do that with boundaries and stuff. I'm happy to make a proposal of a springboard that you could take and analyze and dissect and get feedback on. And that would be a, a mix of three dr districts using the interstate and 20th or even 395 and just have, you know, south of the interstate, east of that, south of the interstate, west of that, and then the northwest Pasco. And I, I think that would be a reasonable just springboard if that's feasible if that's not a good approach that's fine i'm just since this is just a brainstorming session that's what i would start if you need a, a proposal or an idea to dissect and bring to people and analyze that's what i would propose as something that i would support if looking at all the information it looked like it fit the criteria all right so <clears throat> i think we've had our comments up here is there anybody in the audience that would care to come on comment on this subject we would, would invite you to come and share with us your thoughts if you are so inclined all right final call okay thank you Ms. Thornton so from this are we what do we want to do going forward is everybody okay with some community some way getting some community feedback or do we want to move forward in another way i think it's something we ought to look at and i i am really the 21 no, in november of 21 i think is is more feasible i, I agree I, with you yeah yeah I think that has the least impact. I think yeah. realistically trying to do it in this next election cycle would be difficult. I mean, that would essentially mean that we as a board make the decision because November is right. a month and a half off and to, we would really have to hurry to make, do something there. If we don't do it, then we, we end up having an election in 20, which means that 
every board member would be up for election again in 20, which maybe that's the most fair thing because then it's not just two board members that have sat for two years. Now it's everybody, but but uh, we can have that discussion. I I would like Ms. Thornton or s you and somebody to help come up with a decision of what would be the best way to get good feedback in a sensitive way from the from the community with a good cross section of the community yeah absolutely so so what based on the questions that you posed tonight um, I think our plan going forward would be to um, meet as a cabinet um, make sure that we had a plan to um, to engage with um, the people with some expertise about, in essence, the next steps in the process, get that um, information to you, and at the same time um, be planning what that community engagement um, effort would look like. Okay, sounds good to me. Is it something else that can also be put like in that quarterly newsletter thing? That, you know, that question about that something that's being thought about and then maybe you know, then we could get some feedback from that people because that goes to everybody. I guess I'd I'd be curious in a, a rather short time if people supported it and understanding how long it would take the company that worked for the city to come up with a recommendation, whether it's three districts and two at large or whatever, four districts and one at large, but how long that would take since they've already done a lot of the research. You know, if they if they said, "Oh, we we know what we'd recommend right now," then I think that may increase or you know shorten our timeline for this. And what we're saying, running it in 2019, might be doable. If they said, "Oh, it's going to take to do a good job on that," it'd take us four months just to make a recommendation. Then the decision might be different. Awesome. Could we could we revisit it shortly at the next meeting um, and talk about that timeline? Yeah, those were my thoughts as well. I'd like to see a timeline because this comment, the start of the discussion was over a year ago and we essentially had the same discussion and said we were in favor of looking at it and now it's a year later and we're just having the same discussion. So I'd really like to see it come back shortly, say this is the proposed timeline, this is what we're gonna do and what our plan is because I think we're all in favor of having a good look at this and, and either voting on it or taking it to the, the voters, however it's, I mean, the most deemed appropriate. Um, and so that we have that timeline instead of, because things are going to be happening now and it's going to, I can see it getting shoved back to the, we'll get to it again in a year or two. Well, I don't know that we let this sit, but I do think, I mean, to my knowledge, nobody's reached out to the community and said, you know what, these are the things that we're thinking. I mean, we've, if they go back and read the minutes to our board meetings or read the agenda, they would know this, but I don't think this has been published in any of our literature or even on our website that we're looking at this. So. I'm not in favor of rushing out and saying, oh, we can do it by November, so let's just do it. I, I would rather get community feedback and input before we, I mean, I'm okay with looking at a timeline and just seeing if it's possible, but I think, I think personally things like this, people need some time to, to consider before we just rush out and say we're gonna do it, even if it's possible to do that. So I guess so. I, I agree with a lot of what you said, but I think if we, consider the lawsuit and what the city did we've gotten community feedback maybe not at the school district level but it, as, as far as voting goes what was recommended there maybe we're different but i it seems like there'd be a quick answer as to why a school district election should be different than the city and maybe it, it's stuff that um like miss lincoln's talking about it you've got paid positions versus non-paid the candidate pool might be smaller I guess there might be research there, but that's not really community input. That's our own research or somebody else researching that for us, right? It, it is. I, I'd note that the geographic boundaries are very different between the, the city and the school districts, so that there, you know, there, there's that consideration as well. So if you can reach out to them, see what they what a realistic timeline is for them, and then and then come up with some way to get some feedback from our community. All right, thanks, Ms. Thornton. All right, so future agenda items. So our next board meeting will start um, at 4.30 with the study session where we will be focused on construction cost escalation. Um, Randy Nunnemaker will prepare a report and also an approach. Um, 
the folks that that follow construction costs may already know um, they're escalating at a pretty drastic rate to the point that people are concerned about them. So, um, and I just that was a create meeting last week around, and it's impacting the port, the county, us, um, anyone who's doing any kind of construction um, project. So, I mean, they're escalating to the like half a percent a month potentially. So for us, um, an organization that's out building buildings right now, that's certainly not ideal. We made a commitment to our voters to deliver on projects, which Randy and his team is working really diligently to look at how do we deal with the construction cost escalation and at the same time, um, maintain our commitment to our voters. So it's a very um, concerning situation. Um, and Randy and his team has been digging into it. He's got a technical team on board. He's been doing his due diligence. And so he'll have a, a comprehensive report for you on October 9th with both what you could expect in terms of construction cost escalation and what our approach would be to try to mitigate that the best that we can. During the board meeting, we'll have reports on uh, pre pre-kinder programs and uh, a report on a kinder registration event that we did this summer. There's been some expansion on around our pre-kinder program, so we're excited to share those with you. And then Robin Hay will be with us to do an extended study on the elementary 16 and 17 naming recommendations. Um, we got a very deep pool of name suggestions for the schools, so we're very grateful to our community and um, employees who participated in that process. And I think Robin has a great process pulled together in committee. We'll have a committee to um, recommend those names to the board. Thank you. All right, uh, board members, is there anything that any of the board members would like to see on an agenda that we that we uh, don't have or haven't had? Um, I guess I'd, and it doesn't have to be in the near future whenever it's convenient, but uh, the update, Miss Miss Whitney alluded to the fact that there was a uh, athletics across the district kind of audit going on um, to look at that just uh, and uh, maybe what would fit in with that I don't know if there's enough time but also look at um, it might not have been part of the audit but at the elementary school level just the opportunities that we're providing at the schools um, with after school all stars and and the other programs we have um, as part of that as well kind of through the equity lens Um, mine are kind of related to the district. We just had a, um, a study session, thank you, on what, do you, what would we call that study session on? I don't remember the title. An annual objectives. Annual objectives. There were some really great things that are already going on in the district, one um, around the Highway Capable Program, one about around a STEM audit. I realize we're a little ways away from that, but I would – you know, as soon as that's available, I would love to see how successful, you know, I think our STEM elementary schools have been compared to our other schools. And then I would love to see how, you know, we have a law that says that we have to, um, we have to support the, ten, t the kids that perform in the top 10%. And I know that there's been a lot going on with that. You have some new people on that, but I would love to see how that translates to in the classroom so I know we're I so as soon as those things are available I would love to see reports on those two in those two areas okay very good so looks like we are to communications mr. Lerman do you want to start Just been uh, attending back to school activities, open houses, uh, uh, back to school events. Uh, went to the Chiawana football game a couple couple Fridays ago, and um, been going to some middle school soccer games. So enjoying the enjoying the fall activities, fall sports, and it's been a great fall to get out there and and see our local teams uh, get their exercise after school. I'll pass. So this last week I attended an activity at Livingston that was a father, child, act, I think they called it me and my guy, and they just did a bunch of sports and physical activity, father or other significant male figure in your life, and it was just great. Took one of my children to that, and 
It was reminiscent of an activity Murray, uh, they had a Murray Curie last year, very similar type event. Um, and it got me thinking with this bus uh, discussion that this is something I would like to maybe suggest for a future, and this is back what Miss Whitney was talking about as far as encouraging more children to, uh, students to walk and ride bikes to school, making sure it's safe. It was timely, the audience comment today about sidewalks, crosswalks. Uh, I've noticed some areas too that are, uh, that I'd like the city to um, make safer. Um, and that we really should promote, uh, there's a program, Safe Routes to School, to really encourage this type of uh, physical activity, walking to school, riding bikes to school. Um, Stevens had this great bike program. It's been in the media multiple times over the last year. And that's the type of thing that we really need to have at other schools. You know, Stevens got a grant to have that, but why can't we do something similar at Ochoa or at McLaughlin? You know, there's, it doesn't have to look exactly the same, but that type of a program that was so successful with those kids, I think could be, is that there's a huge need at our other middle schools and teaching them bike safety and encouraging that. I think that's something that we need to look at. Um, cause it seems like we often, unless we can financially support an unlimited number of people for an activity that we just don't do it. So it's either that an entire school will fund you or your school can't have this activity. And so that's really disappointing. And I think we need to reevaluate that as, as far as under the lens of equity, like we've talked about, uh, that we need to make sure that those things are available for other students and not just the schools that get grants for things that are really essential. Lastly, as part of that discussion, physical activity before school during recess, I think that can be part of that discussion as well. A lot of our schools do not allow the kids to, to be active before school. They have to sit in a line on the, on the ground. Um, and on, on recesses, they are constantly told, don't run on the blacktop, don't run, you know, and it's really just discouraging as a child. And, and just to see that when we have a lot of uh, health issues in our country that I see every day at work, we really need to uh, enable our students to be active. So I would love to see all those things as part of a discussion in the future. Okay, so um, first I want to congratulate Pasco High on finally winning their first football game since 2015. <laughs> On September 14th, they beat Southridge. So, yeah. <laughs> also, it's Suicide Awareness Week at uh, Pasco High. So today we had an assembly um, during first hour in the auditorium. And then next Saturday at Edgar Brown, it'll be the 37th annual Cavalcade of Bands and you can purchase tickets from any Pasco High band member or online at cavalcadeofbandswashington.org. Uh, Cavalcade this week I had the chance to go to an IPAL open house to help get parents involved with their students online learning. And this year is my first year with IPAL and I'm doing my civics class there. And I just think it's a great opportunity for students who don't have the ability to fit a class into their schedule to be able to take it and still get that credit that they need to graduate. And so I think it's a great program. Uh, well, I'd like to say congratulations to all us three for getting through the first month of school. <laughs> You know, be, there's still big things yet to come, and you know, I guess we're we're getting slowly prepared. Uh, September's almost over, which is the slowest month we all agreed on. Um, but you know, we're slowly getting there. So, good luck to us on the rest of the school year. So, I'm, I I love to comment on how slowly getting there, in a mother's perspective, is completely different. As I have graduated four children in the last five years, it goes quickly, so enjoy every minute of it. Um, I, was, I have been so excited for PASCO. Um, I was thrilled. My husband was thrilled. We're both Chihuahua parents, and all of our boys have um, been on the football team. And so it was fun to see how excited he was, because PASCO didn't just win, they won big over Southridge. So that was, that was impressive, and I, I love to see that. I think, I think that we're going to see some great things coming out of that, I'm, I'm hoping. So um, first few weeks of school, been in and out of the schools more than I even care to be at this point. But I have um, appreciated all the time spent 
with our kids. Um, I can be a pain as a parent sometimes, and I appreciate the time spent with lately when I have had some needs with some of my um, special needs kids. So I appreciate all the work. I know it's a rough we a rough month for our um, our teachers and counselors and and staff, especially with all of the new principals at various different um, schools and, and getting that off the ground. So so um, it's nice to have a month under our belts. So last weekend I was in Spokane to the attending the WASDA Legislative Assembly, which is where um, all the different districts get together and set the legislative priorities for WASDA for the upcoming legislative session and also to vote on positions. We also heard from several um, representatives there from both our legislature, OSPI, State Board of Education, and also from the governor's office. As you might imagine, there was a lot of talk around funding. Um, so we've had some funding for a, a large additional funding towards schools, but uh, I think everybody recognizes that's not enough. I'm not sure exactly how they're going to resolve that, but but there was quite a consensus there that, that we've got to do more. A couple of the comments that were made. I think everybody acknowledges that our teachers now are doing a lot more than what teachers used to do. Their, their workload is significant. They're not just teaching, but they're, they're counselors and uh, uh, sometimes filling the role of parents. And, and one of the, uh, one of the uh, state senators who was there actually made that comment. She, there was, she was in some meeting and they were talking about some of the things that people were doing or some of the things that they needed to do and she said that used to be the role of the parent and now more of that is falling to our school leaders and so um, I think there's some awareness of that and I, I don't know what the solution is but, but I think they're trying to get more funding to more counselors. Uh, one of the things that, that we talked about was a big topic was school safety so more um, SROs is that s safety resource officers I don't know security school, resource. school just school resource officers all right so anyway th I think everybody acknowledges we need some more uh, supports there but in general there's just more need in our school districts so that that's going to be a continuing challenge going forward is getting the funding for those one of the things that we did talk about, and there was actually a position to increase the local levy amount. Of, for those who have followed that, there are limits on it now. And uh, our district is limited to $1.50 per thousand, which gets us less than, I mean, if we have LEA, the, the local effort assistance or the additional state assistance, then we can get up to $1,500 per student. And there was a position to increase that, so hopefully we can get some relief there. But a lot of concern around the state on the local levies, and so I would imagine that will have a pretty high priority in this upcoming legislative session. Uh, oh, and one of the things, one of the comments, I think this was a student that actually made this comment, but pointed out that, you know, our coaches have, or our sports teams have five coaches. But when we go to school, we have one counselor for hundreds of kids, and something, the ratio is off there. So we're, and I think if we look at it from that way, we, we recognize that there's places that we definitely need more support, and hopefully from the legislature we can get some support there. But, but it's going to take time and patience and, uh, and even a little pressure from, from local school districts. So those who were at our last, I think it was our study session, we talked about these things and our priorities for this upcoming session as a district will be to get additional funds for, for supports in our district. So, And along those lines, as far as WASDA goes, there is a regional meeting next Monday in Burbank for those who can attend. So uh, that's my report.
I just wanted to invite the board to an event on October 2nd. There's a Connect Tri-Cities event, which is a partnership event with our local Hanford contractors. They do a big um, STEM-related competition. There's a job fair. It's a, it's a pretty significant lift for that um, organization, and it's pretty incredible for our kids. There is an event on the 2nd at 5 o'clock. It's an evening event. Um, we have teams from Chiwana, I know for sure, and maybe other schools that are participating in their STEM competition. And last year, Chiwana was a winner at that um, event. So if you have time to pop by, we could be honoring some of our, our students who could potentially win the STEM competition. And um, the it's at the Three Rivers Convention Center. Thank you for asking. I was at the STEM um, Foundation board meeting where they announced this event, and um, they sh they actually admitted out loud that Pasco is their favorite. So we might be favorites to win. This would be awesome. <laughs> we are requesting an executive session under 4231101G under personnel, and it'll take about 45 minutes. All right. We thank you for attending tonight's board meeting. We will recess now into executive session.